right, hello and welcome to the beginning of Wisdom Live. I uh, hope we're coming through. We're have, running into some technical stuff today, but uh, excited about this show for you today. We are doing an interview with Sam Shamoon, uh, who is going to be talking to us about stuff related to the Trinity, uh, ministry to Islam, things like that. Uh, it's going to be awesome. So, um, hey, and guess what? We got today, my wife Nikki is here with me in the studio. Hello, everyone. She's feeling better now, so uh, it's going to be awesome. So um, without further ado, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, and bring Sam on the show, and we are going to get into a, a interesting conversation, I hope. we. Uh, he's really big on the Trinity. Uh, I've learned a lot, actually, from his website and and things like that so uh let's see sammy there all right let i can hear you and i think let me go ahead and get over to where you are and where did your sound go hang on one moment okay for some reason why am i on screen oh i see what happened there we go (laughs) sorry i didn't get you there. So there's there you are, Sam. How are you doing today? I'm good, <clears throat> by the grace of Jesus Christ. So everything awesome. good? Everything is good. Uh, yeah. Got our got our kids in bed just in the nick of time, yeah. and yeah. Uh, just yeah. uh, ready to to come on the show. And um, so kind of how this came about. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had an interview with Ethan Smith. I believe it was that show. Uh, you kind of came into the chat and asked about, or maybe it wasn't that particular interview, but we were talking about a debate on the Trinity and had said, yeah, if, you know, if we talk about Trinity, you'd, that uh, you'd like to come on. And, and, you know, I've, like I said, I've, I've learned a lot from you and, and it's a pleasure to, to have you on. Man, it's my honor and my priv- privilege to be here, but <clears throat> a little under the weather because I was traveling for a whole uh-huh. week, went through several states with a fantastic team of evangelists preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm a little under the weather. Yeah. So I pray like the grace of Jesus, a speedy recovery. And <clears throat> as is my habit, I just invoke the God and Father of the Lord Jesus to bless this session, to fill us with the Spirit, to anoint us, to speak truth without error, for the glory of Jesus Christ, so that Christ will increase in us and that we decrease in Jesus' name. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We need you in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Like I said, it's an honor to be here. So yeah, you know, you you mentioned being uh, going traveling around. I I did follow your uh, your posts on Facebook and saw where you were going to different mosques and having conversations with Muslims. And I saw a picture <laughs> from Dearborn, the sort of you know Islamic capital of the United States, at least uh, that they there's a lot big big population there. Um, what was I guess uh, how did that trip come about? What what spurred you to do that and and all that. Well, uh, there's a pastor, a local pastor. Here, um, I don't want to give too much information about mm-hmm. him. That <clears throat> decided to embark on a one-week-long <clears throat> evangelistic tour, specifically in the East Coast. So we went from Michigan. Well, actually, we started in Indiana, went to mm-hmm. Michigan, ended up in Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York. <clears throat> I and six others, including the pastor, went around not just mosques they also did local outreaches to to some of the shadiest areas the team reached prostitutes and drug addicts with the gospel of jesus christ prayed for people loved on people and many people just gave their life to jesus christ now and with my encounters at the mosque unfortunately not every mosque was receptive to invite us in and have dialogues but in those places in which dialogues did take place Glory to Jesus Christ, I was able to use the Quran to demonstrate <clears throat> the deity of Christ. Now, that may sound hmm. to be a contradiction, right? How right. do you use the Quran to prove that Jesus is God when the Quran goes out of its way to deny that Jesus is God in the flesh? Well, interestingly, the Quran is an inconsistent scripture. <clears throat> right. By that I mean, and I know skeptics accuse the Bible of the same thing, that the Bible has errors. But when it comes to the Quran, you can demonstrate genuine errors in that you have the Quran affirming in one breath that Jesus is no more than a servant of Allah, but then the Quran goes on to attribute certain characteristics, functions, and titles to Jesus that clearly show he's more than human, 
that he's fully divine and participates in the very being of Allah himself. Allah being the Arabic name for the Muslim deity, mm -hmm. which Muslims think is the same God as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I, I looked at some of those passages, particularly where the Quran identifies Jesus Christ as the word of Allah cast down to Mary and a spirit proceeding from him. Now the passage that I'm referring to in the Quran is chapter 4, verse 171. <clears throat> now, I don't know how familiar your audience would be with the Quran. The Quran consists of 114 chapters. Each chapter is called a surah, mm -hmm. and each verse is called an ayah. So when I'm speaking to non-Muslims, I would say chapter 4, verse 171. But when I'm speaking to Muslims, you would say Surat al so and so because each chapter has a specific name. So I would say Surat al Nisa, the chapter of the woman, Ayah 171. So the Quran affirms that Jesus is the pre existent Word of God who came down from God as a spirit, spirit into mm -hmm. Mary's womb to become flesh. This is the closest the Quran comes to affirming John's prologue, <clears throat> specifically the incarnation of the Lagos that the word became flesh at a specific point in time. And glory to Jesus Christ, those Muslims who heard were pretty much shaken to see that this is what the Quran says, though the Quran also contradicts itself regarding the person of Christ. So we had some right. fruitful discussions, and I pray seeds were planted, and by the grace of God's Spirit, those seeds will be watered until these Muslims come to saving faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I have not heard that before. I'd, I'd, uh, I, I had heard about the Quran being... Um, somewhat inconsistent with uh you know especially inconsistent with a lot of the way muslims talk today because um one of my favorite videos online is david wood uh the uh the muslims uh oh, what's the word well their dilemma the the fact yeah. that the quran says believe the new testament but most islamic teachers say no you know don't believe yes. the new, it's corrupted and all that but the quran never says the new testament is corrupted no yeah no and the fact the Quran tells Christians to judge by their New Testament <clears throat> and live according to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, then clearly according to the New Testament that the Christians possessed at the time of Muhammad. And the verses that I have in mind, for those who want to take notes and go back and check whether I'm quoting accurately or misquoting, chapter 5 of the Quran, verses 46 to 47. There, Muhammad's Christian contemporaries, <clears throat> the Christians that he's engaging, interacting with, are told, to judge by the gospel they possess at that time. Mm -hmm. And if they fail to judge by it, they are unbelievers. Now, historically, historically, this is just the fact of history, historical, archaeological, textual proof. The only gospel that those Christians would have at the time of Muhammad, Muhammad is 7th century AD, mm -hmm. would be the very gospel we find inscripturated in the New Testament. They had no other gospel. So if I take the Quran seriously, that means I have to judge Islam Judge Muhammad by the very gospel I possess today because it's identical to what they possessed at the time of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And that gospel is the New Testament. And according to my New Testament, Muhammad is an antichrist. I don't mean to be rude. I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive. But at the same time, I can't be politically correct. According to the New Testament, specifically 1 John, the epistle of John, <clears throat> chapter 2, verses 22 to 23, there we're told that an antichrist is one who denies the father and the son. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, the Quran says, Allah is a father to no one. And in chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran, those Christians who say, in chapter 9, verse 30, those Christians who say that Jesus is the son of Allah, Allah will fight them. So Muhammad's God is not a father, and Jesus isn't his son. Well, according to the gospel that the Quran commands me to judge, that makes Muhammad an antichrist. And thus you get the Islamic dilemma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, you know, you mentioned, yeah, I mean, if it, saying that obviously to any Muslim that that Muhammad is an antichrist is is gonna gonna certainly get some reaction. <laughs> um, you know, I I'm curious. You know, I have I don't have any personal. Um, I I've I've met you know I've had some Muslim friends, but I don't have any you know, real personal experience with encounters with Muslims in terms of apologetics. You know, I, I, I dealt more with like Unitarians and, and a lot of other different religious groups, but, but I just don't live in a place that has a whole lot of Muslims. We, we do have some, but, um, my one question I had, cause I watch, you know, I, I've watched some of your videos. I've watched a lot of David Wood's videos, um, you know, in, in encountering Muslims, um, and uh, 
there's definitely uh, I get I, I guess what I wanted to ask is just kind of what do you see is the best you know for someone like me I've 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 studied my Bible quite a bit I I know theology pretty well but I I haven't really had a lot of specific interactions you know what kind of things would you say is the best way to go about you know interacting with with Muslims to have the best effect the those good conversations like you're talking about the most important crucial thing is to know your own faith know mm -hmm. why you believe what you believe know the scriptures <clears throat> because I don't care where you live I don't care which Muslim you encounter whether a Sunni Muslim a Shia mm -hmm. Muslim because Islam is like Christianity it's not monolithic right there are different expressions of Islam they're going to have the same set of questions across the board and this was clearly <clears throat> seen by the fact that the Muslims I encountered in let's say Dearborn brought up the same objections that the Muslims in Indiana brought up the mm -hmm. same objections that the Muslims in Philadelphia brought up because <clears throat> there are certain questions that Muslims across the board will ask Christians for example your Bible is corrupt there's so mm -hmm. many variant readings when it comes to the extent manuscripts of the Bible how can we trust it as a reliable source another thing because the Quran does deny that Jesus is God as I said it teaches a contradictory it presents a contradictory portrait of Jesus in one breath it affirms his divine pre human existence as the word another breath it denies his his deity so the Muslims <clears throat> are either taught or they picked up from their their favorite apologists that they watch on YouTube like Zakir Naik or Ahmad Idad, right to ask specific questions of Christians to get them to start doubting that the New Testament teaches the deity of Christ and the Trinity so the best way to deal with Muslims is know your faith know why you believe in the Trinity why do mm -hmm. you believe Jesus is eternally God who became flesh why do you believe in the divine person of the Holy Spirit why do you believe in the authority and preservation of scriptures and <clears throat> How do you know what the gospel is? Become grounded, strengthened in the core doctrines of the Christian faith, and that will help you with Muslims, and it will help you across the across the board, right. because Muslims will ask the same typical questions about the Trinity that Unitarians do, that Joe's Witnesses do. There's nothing new under the sun. It's the same argument, maybe slightly repackaged. Now, there is a question that is unique to Muslims in that I haven't really encountered Many Unitarians or even Joe's Witnesses raise this as an objection against the deity of Christ, but it's one that Muslims raise all the time. Here's the challenge. <clears throat> the challenge goes like this. Show me where Jesus says in, the, in these exact words, I am God or worship me. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, I, I, I think I probably read once, if mm -hmm. my memory doesn't fail me, in a Jehovah Witness publication where they made a similar argument that Jesus didn't say he's God. Right. But for the most part, this is a unique objection that I don't hear Unitarians or Jehovah's Witnesses raise up not even <clears throat> once in a while. You know, right. I, Like I said, if I have heard it, it was probably in some article by a Jehovah's Witness years ago. But Muslims will raise this all the time. Where did Jesus say, I am God, or worship me? Now, what they're trying to get you to see is Jesus nowhere claims to be divine. Mm -hmm. Well, if he doesn't claim to div 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 uh, be divine, why do you believe in his divinity? Now, then you would quote, let's say, the prologue of John. The Muslims will tell you, well, that's John's theology. We don't accept John as an inspired prophet. So what he says about Jesus is irrelevant to us because we recognize Jesus as a prophet. And what he says, we accept. Mm -hmm. So if he doesn't say it, we don't accept it. So this is the Muslim mindset. So these are some of the unique objections that Muslims raise that we need to be prepared for. Now, I don't know if you want me to address that objection, but again, that's up to you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, the best way to answer that objection, understand the assumption. Jesus has to say something in order for it to be true. If the writer of the New Testament says it, they reject it because they don't recognize the writers of the New Testament as inspired prophets. That's something that Islam <clears throat> recognizes is the prophets of the Bible, starting with Adam, because they believe Adam was a prophet, culminating with Jesus as far as prophets sent to Israel, but they do not recognize the disciples of Jesus, the apostles of Jesus, or the New Testament writers as inspired emissaries mm. of God. They don't. So to them, it's irrelevant what John says. He's not inspired. It's irrelevant what Paul says. He's not receiving revelation. 
So they want the words of Jesus. Now that gets a little tricky because if you could show that Jesus said he's God, they would still reject it because then they would tell you, well, how do you know Jesus said it? Right. It's not really a question asked out of sincerity, but be that as it may, let's address it nonetheless for the benefit of the Christians because it is a good argument. Why didn't Jesus just come out and say, I am God? Well, mm -hmm. think about it historically. If Jesus is preaching to the Jews, and it's similar to the Unitarian or Jehovah's Witness today. See, when I say Jehovah to a Jehovah's Witness, in his mind, Jehovah is the Father alone. The Father alone is Jehovah. Jehovah is the Father and no one else. So if I were to say to a Jehovah's Witness, Jesus is Jehovah, that would be interpreted in the mind of the Jehovah's Witness that Jesus is the Father because he has no concept of the Trinity. For me to say to a Jehovah's Witness, Jesus is Jehovah, is the same as me saying Jesus is the Father. That would create confusion. Mm -hmm. And thus the questions. Well, if Jesus is Jehovah, who is he praying to? Who sent him? Whose son is he? Mm -hmm. Because they don't define Jehovah as a term applicable to the members of the Godhead. Right. Well, similarly in the first century, when you say to a first century Jew, especially living in Israel, when you say God, in his mind, God is the one up there in heaven, whom they call the Father. So for Jesus to come out and say, I am God, would have been miscommunication, because to a Jew, for Jesus to claim to be God, would have been understood as a claim to being the Father in heaven, and clearly he's not the Father. Right. So now, how could Jesus avoid confusion? How could he affirm his deity without suggesting to his audience that he's claiming to be the Father? In other words, how can Jesus say he's God without the Jews assuming that he's claiming to be the Father? The precise way we find him articulating his deity in the Gospels. He claims to be the Son of God in a unique sense that makes him equal to the Father in essence, but personally distinct from him. And the Jews understood, though you're not claiming to be God the Father, you are claiming to be God nonetheless. Mm -hmm. So there would have been no better way for Jesus to communicate his deity than the way we find him articulating it in the Gospels. So this mm -hmm. is why he doesn't go around saying, I am God, because that would have miscommunicated. But he does claim to be the Son of God, distinct from the Father, who can do all that the Father does because he's one with the Father in essence, and therefore just as much God as the Father is, God who became flesh. Now with that said, I like to then turn the objection against the Muslim. Here's how I turn it against them. Mm -hmm. And this will help your audience how to more effectively witness to the Muslims. Now, notice the assumption. Jesus has to say something in order for it to be true. Now, when I appeal to the Quran, obviously, I don't believe the Quran is the inspired word of God. But I do appeal to it because Muslims believe it's inspired and it's authoritative for them. Right. So I'm using the Quran, which they believe is authoritative to make my case, Similarly to how Paul would quote the Greek pagans and their writings to make his case. For example, in Acts 17, 28, Paul quotes one of the Greek poets, as he says in Acts 17, 28, as one of your own poets said, we're all the offspring of God. Mm -hmm. So Paul himself would use the sources and the literature of the people that he was witnessing to, to confirm his argument, his claim, his position. So we have a biblical basis for appealing to the Quran to make our case. So what I tell the Muslim is this. You believe Jesus is the Messiah, the virgin-born son of Mary, a spirit from Allah, spirit from God, that's chapter 4, verse 171, <clears throat> and the word of God, word of Allah, cast down to Mary. Mm -hmm. So then I challenge them, show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I am the word of God. Show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I'm the son of Mary. Show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I'm the Messiah. Show me in your Quran where Jesus says, I'm a spirit from God. You won't find it. He never says it. And even if he did say it, we know that the historical Jesus doesn't speak in the Quran. The Quran puts words in the mouth of Jesus. But for argument's sake, they can't find it. Therefore, according to your logic, if Jesus never says he's the Messiah, he can't be the Messiah. If he never says he's the son of Mary, he can't be the son of Mary. If he never mm -hmm. said he's the word of God. So your logic proves too much. It proves that you can't be a Muslim anymore because you can't believe in the Islamic Jesus. Now, what's their response? Their response is, well, he doesn't have to say it. The Quran says it, and the Quran is the word of God. Therefore, it's mm -hmm. good enough for us. Oh, but hold on. You just told me, unless Jesus says something, you won't accept it. So then when I now apply the same criterion to mm -hmm. your beliefs 
Now, all of a sudden, that's not a valid criticism, not, not a valid way of arguing, and you, you simply brush it aside. If Jesus doesn't have to say it in order for it to be true, then why insist that I have to show you Jesus claiming to be God in order for it to be true? Why isn't it good enough for you to accept the testimony of the Bible, especially in those places where God the Father himself bears witness to who Jesus is? For example, in Hebrews 1 verse 8, it says about the Son, he says, Hebrews 1 verse 8, mm -hmm. God the Father says about the Son, your throne, O God, and in the Greek it's Hatheos. Right. Your throne, the God, Hatheos, is forever and ever. And in that same context, verses 10 to 12, the Father glorifies the Son, praises the Son for being the Lord, who at the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and made the hand, uh, heavens with his own hands. Mm -hmm. And he'll roll up the heavens and the earth, but he remains the same. A citation of Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, where the psalmist praises Jehovah God as the unchanging creator and sustainer of all creation that's now ascribed to the Son by the Father himself. So the Father glorifies Jesus as the God who reigns forever and as the immutable Lord who created and sustains all things. Mm -hmm. Right. I can I ask you a question about that? Yes. Um, you, so I, I'm follow, if I'm following the argument right, that you know what the New Testament says, as in Paul or other people, is, is out, out the window because it's not the words of Jesus. Have, have any, when you've used this, this line of reasoning, have any Muslims pointed out that, well, the Quran, it's a different story because Muhammad is a prophet versus like Paul not being one? Have any of them appealed to that as, as like if the Quran says all these things about Jesus, but he doesn't say yes. it himself? But at, then the point would still, uh, would still remain, you're having someone else saying this about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's not Jesus himself saying it, but someone else whom they deem to be authoritative and reliable saying it on behalf of Jesus. If mm -hmm. that's the principle, then we can go into the Old Testament text mm -hmm. where they won't deny that the Old Testament prophets were prophets of God. Right. And you can easily turn to Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7, mm -hmm. where the prophet Isaiah says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government which shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, El Gibor, mm -hmm. Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, we know that's a messianic prophecy because it goes on to say in verse 7 that upon the throne of David, he will reign forever and ever. Now, what's interesting about that is that that phrase, El Gibor, Mighty God, is used only one other time in the book of Isaiah and the very next chapter. In Isaiah 10, verse 21, where in the context, Yahweh, or Jehovah, is said to be the Mighty God, El Gibor. Mm -hmm. And since Isaiah goes out of his way to affirm there aren't two mighty gods, because in Isaiah, you have Yah Yahweh, Jehovah, going out of his way to say that he is God, he is Il, he is Elohim, there is no other. Right. That means, in some sense, this child who is born is the incarnation of Jehovah, because only Jehovah is the mighty God, and yet he's also distinct from Je Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So if, if they de demand prophetic witness to the deed of Christ, we have that. And Isaiah comes... Over 700 years before the Lord, about 2,200 years before the birth of Muhammad. And what's interesting about Isaiah 9 6, it directly opposes and contradicts a verse in the Quran. In Isaiah 9 6, it says, A child is born. Yelid, Yudad. Yelid, child, Yudad, born. Now, why is that interesting? Hebrew and Arabic are cognate languages, they're mm -hmm. Semitic languages and are quite similar. Right. You have a statement in the Quran, chapter 112 of the Quran, verse 3. It says, Lem Yelid. Walem yulad. Sounds similar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Isaiah says, Yelad yulad. Quran says, Lam yelad, walem yulad. Here in Isaiah, in, in chapter 112, verse 3 of the Quran, it says, Allah neither begets nor is born. And yet here Isaiah, about 2200 years before the birth of Muhammad, says, A child is born who is God. So God can be born as a man. Mm -hmm. You don't get more contradictory than Isaiah's statement about the Messiah being the mighty God who was born as a child, and the Quran's denial that God can be born. Yeah. Would you say that uh, a lot of when you're talking to Muslims that it, it always kind of comes back around to the Trinity? Oh, or... yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It comes down to the Trinity because, again, the major difference 
the major difference between Muslims and Christians is their conception of God and Jesus' relationship to God, mm -hmm. right? Right. Because there are a lot of similarities between the two. Of course, there are other profound differences, but when it comes to the heart of the matter, the heart of the matter is who and what God is like. Who is God? What is he like? Mm -hmm. And since Muslims believe that the God of the Quran is the same God of the Bible, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that Jesus preached, they must find a correspondence between what Muhammad taught about God and what the prophets in the Bible said about God. Now, they're facing a dilemma because we find plenty of statements in the Bible where God is depicted as multi-personal. Right. Now, they claim that the Old Testament conception of God is similar to the chronic conception of God and that the New Testament is the odd man out. In other words, mm -hmm. the New Testament presents a totally contradictory picture from the Old Testament, in that the Old Testament denies that God is tri-person, or so they think. Right. The Old Testament denies that God is a man or a son of man, all of which the Quran agrees with the Old Testament over against the New Testament, which is why it's important. I brought this up because I want to encourage the Christians to study the Old Testament basis and foundation for the Trinity. One mm -hmm. of the most effective ways of demonstrating the consistency between the New Testament and the Old Testament is to be able to point to Old Testament texts where God is clearly depicted as multi-personal. Now, I'm aware that some Christians believe that the Trinity is the revelation that takes place at the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And what you have in the New Testament is the inscripturation of the revelation of the Trinity. Right. This position would deny that you can go to the Old Testament and find explicit references to God's multi-personal nature. Mm -hmm. Even though many Christians believe that, if you look at it historically, this was not the view of the early church. If you actually read or even peruse the writings of the early church fathers, you'll find copious citations of Old Testament passages where the church fathers looked to the Hebrew Bible, especially in their witness to the Jews, to prove that even in the Hebrew Bible, you have clear, mm -hmm. emphatic references to God's multi personal nature. And mm -hmm. this is important for the Christian for two reasons. It's important, number one, to show that the Muslims, that their concept of the Quran not only contradicts the New Testament, but opposes the Old Testament. And secondly, it's important our witness to the Jews, because one of the objections that Jews raise is that the Trinity is an altogether novel concept of who God is, one mm -hmm. alien to the relation of God and the Old Testament. And on the basis of passages such as Deuteronomy 13, we Jews have every right to reject that God because in Deuteronomy 13, ironically, it says, if a prophet, and for those of you taking references, Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 10, it says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams talks about a sign that will take place, and it takes place, God says he'll even be able to prophesy something that will take place in the future, and it comes to pass. But then he comes and tells you, come, let us worship gods that neither we nor our fathers have known, God says, don't do it. The Lord is mm -hmm. testing you. Right. On the basis of that passage, many Jews say the Trinity is an altogether novel concept. It's another God from the God revealed in the Old Testament. So even if Jesus has been raised from the dead, so what? This is simply God's way of testing us whether we'll forsake that which is already established for a novel concept of God. So you have to be able to demonstrate God's multi-personal nature from the Hebrew Scriptures. Right. I want to qualify that. I'm not saying that the New Testament doesn't give you a more fuller, complete understanding of that mm -hmm. revelation. Of course it does. Yeah. I think, like, what I see is, you know, you mentioned the the revelation being the incarnation and the outpouring. And I think there's a sense in which, um, I guess the way I would characterize it is that the Old Testament gives us it, just like in a lot of other things, it gives us types and shadows. It gives us a lot of truths, but not fully explained. And then when Jesus shows up and he's incarnated and, and they see, they're like, what kind of, you know, what kind of man is this that he speaks to the, you know, the wind and it yeah. stops and things like that. Um, they realize, they realize this, this sort of second Yahweh figure, this multi-personal thing going on is like oh that's him like like before they knew there was and i do i i agree i've, I've studied a lot of stuff with the two powers theology of, <laughs> of the of, yeah yeah 
Outstanding. And I highly recommend Michael Eisner's work. He's outstanding. Michael yeah. Brown himself and yeah. his answering Jewish objections to Jesus. Mm -hmm. They demonstrate the extent Jewish literature, both be before the time of Christ and the literature produced after Christ, that the Jews, apart from the New Testament, were fully aware of mm -hmm. two powers in heaven. And then you have the Targums, the Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament, where they right. clearly speak of the Memra, the Word of God, mm -hmm. appearing as a messenger sent from God who is identified as God. In other words, the prologue of John wasn't teaching anything new to the Jews. They would have known of the Word of God, distinct from God, who is God. Mm -hmm. The only new element he added is by saying the Word became flesh. Right, and and now they knew who it was. They said, "Look, this Jesus, this this man, this is the the one." You know, and that's what they took as blasphemous. By the way, what's that? That this man, Jesus, is that word that we've been reading about. Right, yeah. right, and they and they and the of course the people who don't believe in Jesus, you know, even though they probably did understand the whole two powers thing, they they thought, well, it's not him, so it's blasphemy. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's it, it. exactly. And again, like I said, excellent work. Groundbreaking work done mm -hmm. in this field is Michael Heiser. Yep. Phenomenal. Yep. I highly recommend getting his works. Michael Brown and his Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, particularly the volume on theological objections, yep. also digs deep into the Jewish background for God's multi personal nature, looking into the Targumim, Philo of Alexandria, contemporary mm -hmm. of Jesus, who spoke of the Logos because he's writing in Greek. So mm -hmm. he mentions the Logos or the Logos yeah. as being a second God. That was the Jewish way of speaking of a second person, right? They didn't use the later categories that Christians use to describe being and persons, right? Right. So yeah, this is something that Jesus' Jewish contemporaries would have known, but the only thing they would have denied is that that Jesus is that Logos. That Jesus is that second power. Mm -hmm. But they right. didn't deny there was a second power, or the Logos, who's distinct from God, who happens to be God. Right. So, yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask you at this point where round halfway through here and I, I wanted to one thing that we do toward the end of the show a lot is questions and answers and things like that and uh, so I just want to let you guys know in the chat who are watching live um, if you have questions uh, maybe you've already been given those to uh, Nikki she is is in there too I see so um, if you have any questions for either myself or or Sam uh, definitely would love questions for Sam since yes. he's he's not here every day, um, and and I've seen some of your other live streams. I know you. That's mainly what you do in those live streams is, is answer those questions. Um, sometimes sometimes very uh, very forcefully. I, I've noticed. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the least <laughs> me, brother. Yeah. So um, so I guess the uh, you know so yeah get those questions in and we will go ahead and and take some time toward the end uh, once she's gathered those for us. And uh, I, I guess one thing I wanted to ask you, as you mentioned, it, it kind of always comes back around to the Trinity. And, and what I've never really understood before is, is this distinction they have with, you know, the Old Testament, they see those as prophets, and the New Testament, they don't, except for Jesus himself. <coughs> um, though they do have the, you know, in the Quran, the, it talks about, you know, you should obey the 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 Torah and the Gospels, you know, and and so it does tell them to trust the the New Testament, but I guess doesn't you know identify them as be, prophets. Their response would be that Jesus is mentioned as a prophet and an apostle, but mm -hmm. his disciples are never said to be prophets or apostles. Mm -hmm. And they would also say that the Quran speaks of the Gospel of Jesus, not the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because in the Quran it says, follow the gospel, singular, Injil in Arabic, but not right. the Enangil, the gospels. <clears throat> now, hmm. for Christians who are witnessing the Muslims, they have to be prepared for these objections not to respond. Although the Quran mentions the gospel, singular, that doesn't mean it's denying the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because again, the passage I alluded to earlier is commanding Christians to judge by the gospel they possess. So, though it's singular... The question that the Muslim has to answer is this. What gospel were the Christians of Muhammad's time reading? Mm -hmm. What gospel did they possess? What gospel were they to judge by? Historically, the answer is obvious. The gospel as inscripturated in the New Testament. That's right. the only gospel they had. So although we have four gospels, it's actually four witnesses to a single gospel. It's the fourfold gospel of Jesus Christ. The mm -hmm. gospel of Christ, seen from Matthew's perspective, from Mark's perspective, from Luke's perspective, 
from John's perspective, but they're not for different Gospels in the sense they're not talking about someone different. Right. It's for perspectives of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And right. early in the 2nd century, this is something that Christians need to know, already in the 2nd century, the Church was identifying the four Gospels as the Gospel of Jesus Christ from four perspectives. So that's mm -hmm. how you get around that. Then the dilemma is obvious. If I am to judge by the New Testament, then the New Testament tells me that Jesus' disciples were more than disciples. They were inspired apostles mm -hmm. who spoke by the Spirit of the risen Christ and passed on commands that were authoritative and divine in origin. Therefore, everything they said by inspiration is binding upon me. This is why David Wood rightly calls this the Islamic dilemma. If I follow the Quran, I have to follow the Gospel in my possession. That is the New Testament. That New Testament teaches me the apostles and their companions were inspired to pass on commands that are divine in origin, binding on all Christians. Therefore, all of it is inspired. All of it is prophetic. There's no mm -hmm. way around it. Right, right. Um, so, when you're... If, if, if a Muslim... You know, I, I heard you say about the one argument they do, but if... Just generally speaking, if you've got sort of your pick um, of where to go and what to say, if if you're speaking with a Muslim and they, they want you to show, like, how do you know that Jesus is God or how do you know yes. the Trinity is true, what is sort of your favorite place to start? You know, not when they've prompted you with something, but but when they just kind of give you an open pass to start where you want. What What's sort of your favorite go-to? It really depends on the Muslim. If the Muslim is someone who's not re well taught, because mm -hmm. the more sophisticated Muslims will reject John. They'll appeal mm -hmm. to liberal political scholarship saying John is a later right. gospel theologically developed. For those Muslims, I would stick with the Gospel of Mark and quote Jesus in Mark affirming his divine identity. Now, mm -hmm. you can do that by going to Mark 2 where Jesus as a son of man has power to forgive sins on earth and does a miracle to prove that he has that divine power Mm -hmm. A power that belongs to God alone, both which the scribes realize, because in Mark 2, 7, they say, he's blaspheming, who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. And ironically, the Quran agrees. In chapter 3, verse 135, it says, Allah alone can forgive sins. So I would start with the Gospel of Mark for those Muslims. Now, for the average Muslim <clears throat> who hasn't studied the arguments, and that John is supposedly more theologically rich and developed than later in time, my favorite passage is to turn to the Quran and cross-reference that with a passage from Revelation. And I'll, I'll take just a few moments yeah. to unpack it. In chapter 57, verse 3 of the Quran, chapter 57, verse 3, Surah Al-Hadid. So people taking notes, take this, this down. It says, He, Allah, is the first and the last. Wal awwal wal akhir. Allah is the first and the last. According to the Quran, Islamic theology, only God can be called the first and last. No creature can be called first and last. Mm -hmm. So when you quote that to the Muslim, you go to Revelation 117. You either have him read it or you read it for the Muslim. There it says, uh -huh. when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He placed his right hand upon me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. So I, I paused there. I asked the Muslim, the one who just said he's the first and last, who is that? Now, we just got done reading the Quran. So the first thing that will come to his mind is Allah. So he'll tell you that's Allah. Because the Quran says, Allah is the first and last. So when right. I read Revelation 117, the speaker says, I'm the first and last. So they'll say, Allah, God. I go, okay, now let's read verse 18. I'm the first and last, verse 18. I'm the living one, and I was dead. And behold, mm -hmm. I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Amen. When did Allah die? <laughs> Not ever. <laughs> no, Allah can never die. But wait. Right. The speaker just said, I'm the first last who was dead and came to life. You right. just admitted that's God. They'll say, well, no, that's not God. That has to be Jesus. So you just admit Jesus claimed to be God who died and came to life. Mm -hmm. That's when they're going to tell you your Bible's crook. Right. <laughs> well, you know, you, you go where you can go. Um, let's see. We've got uh, a couple questions. We've got a couple of questions coming in, so I want to make sure we have time for it. And if we run out of those, we'll, I got I've got some other questions. But uh, let's go ahead. So Nomadic B asks Sam, 
Would most American Muslims be considered moderate? Repeat the question. Would most Funny. American Muslims be considered moderate? They'd be considered what again? Moderate. Moderate? Yeah, would most well, Americans... It's hard to say. Uh, that, see, that, uh, you know, I don't have access to the hearts. Obviously, mm -hmm. only God does. Right. When you say would most American Muslims be moderate, it depends on the kind of Islam they've embraced. If they've embraced the more mystical aspect of Islam, then you could say, for the most part, they would be more moderate, more peaceful, more tolerant. But I've discovered that in the West, most of the Muslim co converts convert to the most tyrannical <clears throat> form of Islam, Salafi Islam. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of Islam that produces your terrorists. So I can't really answer the question. I'd have to see what kind of Islam that mm -hmm. particular American has embraced. Now, if you're talking about Muslims who've migrated to the West and are American Muslims in the sense that now they've migrated to the West and are American Muslims, that again, I can't generalize. It depends on the particular branch of Islam that they subscribe to, and even then, are they zealous Muslims? Because for the most part, most Muslims are nominal Muslims. They're just Muslims culturally. They're Muslims by name, but not by practice, and not by conviction. They were born in Muslim homes, and so they call themselves Islam, Muslim, but they're very westernized, and don't follow the, the tenets of Islam. So I can't really say whether most American Muslims are moderate or not. You'd have to judge them on an individual basis. So I can't generalize. That mm -hmm. would be doing a disservice to the Muslims as a whole, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, Samirna Mountain, our good friend, asks, I would like to know about the science of hadiths. I have read a lot of Sahih Bukhari, and I think that is known as the most accurate. How do they determine? I know that is a heavy question, but maybe he could answer in brief. The science of Hadith. Well, the science of Hadith. Now, she mentioned Sayyid Bukhari. For the Sunni Muslims, not the Shia, the largest branch of Islam are Sunni Muslims. The second largest branch is Shia Islam. The Sunni branch makes up roughly about 85% of Muslims worldwide. Now, with that said, that doesn't mean the 85% Muslims who claim to be Sunni know what the Sunni sources teach or are following it. They simply identify with that particular school or sect, I should say. For the Sunni Muslims, Sayyid Bukhari is second to the Quran. It is the most authentic, most authoritative collection of narrations attributed to Muhammad and his followers, second only to the Quran. Now, how do they determine whether a narration is sound or not? They have what is called the Sannad or Isnad, the chain of transmitters, where this person narrates from this person, who narrates from this person, who narrates from this person, who narrated from, from Muhammad. Now, the problem with this chain of transmission is that Bukhari's collection was compiled about 200 years after the death of Muhammad. So you have to depend on Bukhari telling you that the person he heard was reliable, and the person he heard before him was reliable, and the person he... So in other words, there's no way of completely validating, authenticating the Hadith, because they're written so much later after these events, about 200 years after the death of Muhammad. But for the Sunni Muslim, a hadith is reliable insofar as every transmitter in the chain is deemed to be reliable, honest, trustworthy, with a sound memory, and the content of the hadith does not contradict the Quran. That's how they determine the validity, the authenticity of a report. All right. I have another question. All right. Valid Core asks. I know they believe Jesus is coming back. Could he explain how that works and what they believe he'll do when he returns? In traditional Islam, there's nothing explicit in the Quran. But in traditional Islam, both Sunni and Shia, they believe Jesus will return physically, bodily from heaven. Why? Because the Quran says that Allah took Jesus physically, bodily to himself. Let me give you the references. Chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran. And chapter 4, verse 158. There it says, Allah took Jesus to himself. So for 2,000 years, Jesus has been physically alive with the Muslim deity above the seven heavens, above the throne. Because according to the Quran, Allah, the Muslim God, who again, Muslims think is the same God as revealed in Christ, 
is above the throne, and his throne is above the seven heavens and the seven earths. In Islamic cosmology, you have seven heavens and seven earths, whatever that means. Jesus is there with Allah above the throne and will come down from Allah to kill the Antichrist. al Masih al-Dajjal. Because Muslims are taught, according to so-called sound narrations attributed to Muhammad, the Antichrist will appear. He'll claim to be God. He'll be one eye. On his forehead will be written kafir, meaning infidel. He'll do miracles. He will persecute Muslims until Jesus comes down and kills him. Now, when Jesus comes down, he doesn't just kill the Antichrist. He will destroy every cross he sees. He'll kill every mm. swine he sees. And he'll abolish what's called the jizya. Jizya is a sum of money that the Quran commands Jews and Christians to pay to their Muslim overlords when and if they've been subjugated, subjugated by Muslims. In other words, if, if Islam takes over America, you and I would have to pay jizya if we wanted to remain alive under Islamic State. If we refuse to pay jizya, they would have to kill us. But when Jesus comes, and by the way, that's chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran. <clears throat> chapter 9, verse 29 says, Jews and Christians pay the jizya, you can maintain your religious identity, but living as second or third class citizens. That's a topic for another time. When Jesus comes, he'll abolish the jizya. Why will he abolish the jizya? Because there'll be no more Jews and Christians to extract jizya from. Because when Jesus comes, he's going to force the entire world to become Muslim. So when Jesus comes, he kills the Antichrist, will force everyone to become Muslim. He'll rule over them for 40 years as a Muslim judge. Then he will die and be buried next to Muhammad in Medina, because that's where Muhammad is buried. And then on the last day, Allah will resurrect Jesus to stand before Allah in judgment. That's what Islamic theology teaches. Thank you. That's, wow. I, I had never really heard that. I, I, I think now, you heard you in passing why, that. The... Now, if you want to know why he kills every pig and destroys all cross, that's his indictment against Christians. In other words, he's basically saying, shame on you Christians for saying that I died on the cross for your sins. Mm. I didn't die for mm. your sins. And by killing the swine, that's also an indictment against us for justifying the eating of swine in Jesus' name. That's mm -hmm. his message to us, basically saying, I never gave you that authority. Hmm. That's why he does it. Wow. Interesting. So um, I guess uh, as we're, you know, for the last little bit, I, I wanted to ask, because um, like I mentioned, I... I, I deal a lot with Unitarians, and, and I know that, that is, Islam is somewhat Unitarian, basically, in its, its theology. Jesus is human. He's not um, divine other than that he's been empowered by God, you know, in, in certain ways. Um, the, uh, you know, one thing that I have found to be true among a lot of uh, what's called biblical Unitarians is they're, they're very interested in talking about, you know, the Greek and lots of things about scholarship and lots of things yes. about logic and, and really getting into a number of things. But um, from what I've sort of gleaned about Muslims, it's it's a lot simpler than that. Like Sort of like you said, where a lot of Muslims will just say, where does Jesus say, I'm God, worship me? And that they yes. think that's just slam dunk. Um, with... Would you say that there are more sophisticated arguments that come from Muslims against the deity of Christ yeah, that, um, other than just you know some of that? Oh yeah, definitely. You have D -dot and stuff. Yeah, no, D -dot and Zechariah, they're yeah. very surface, they're shallow. Yeah. You have the more sophisticated Muslims, such as Shibr Ali. Shibr mm -hmm. Ali is perhaps the best apologist when it comes to presenting the more the more sophisticated forms of arguments against Christianity because he's well steeped in liberal, critical, biblical scholarship. So you do have those Muslims who have mm -hmm. studied biblical criticism, who have studied liberal scholars, who have studied Unitarian materials, Joe Witness materials, in order to present a more sophisticated form of attack against the Trinity and the deity of Christ. So don't be surprised if you watch a Shabir Ali lecture or a debate. Mm -hmm. He'll be appealing to the Greek because he's studying websites or books written by Anthony Buzzard. Right. Or even Joe's Witnesses, where they'll go into John 1 1 and talk about how it's a pre you know you know pre verbal predicate nominative. So you do have that sophisticated aspect of Islamic apologetics. But yeah. 
for the most part, that's not common. Mm -hmm. That's the exception to the rule. Shibra Ali is an exception to the rule. In fact, there's a, someone that I consider a colleague, not a friend. His name mm -hmm. is Paul Williams. He's an Englishman who was, born, quote unquote, a born again Christian who became a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And the reason why he left Christianity is because he was steeped in biblical, critical scholarship. The kind of scholarship that pretty much attacks the very foundation of the Bible. The kind of scholarship he doesn't use against the Quran. So he uses it for the Bible, but doesn't use it for the Quran. Mm -hmm. He is steeped in that kind of scholarship, in the James D.G. Dunn's of the world, or the Bart Ehrman's, or others. So he's mm -hmm. quoting them to try to undermine the explicit New Testament witness to the Trinity deed of Christ. He'll quote Richard Balcom, he'll quote N.T. Wright, he'll quote F.F. F. Bruce, he'll quote people to try to prove that the historical Jesus never claimed to be God, and that hmm. the absolute deity of Christ is only affirmed in the later writings, specifically John's Gospel. And then he'll attack John's Gospel as being the least historical, because of mm -hmm. the kind of scholarship that he appeals to. Yeah, it's funny too, because I mean, I know Dunn, I believe, is is Unitarian, or at least I know a lot, a lot of Unitarians like to, to quote him. He, he'll claim um, to be a Trinitarian, Mm -hmm. But his arguments are thoroughly Unitarian in that he believes yeah. the Trinity is something that evolved throughout centuries, but it's not explicitly taught in the Bible. In fact, he believes that the Incarnation is only taught in John's Gospel. Interesting. Um, and the uh, but you mentioned Balcom. I I see. You know, he's one of the most, one of the best. I think in terms of really getting into the history and understanding. Like, look from the very beginning, the Christians were they were worshiping Jesus as God. I mean, they weren't using. <laughs> the language that that we've inherited from you know later councils and things like that but they were they were thoroughly trinitarian in in every biblical sense um they 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 believe you know they worshiped god or jesus as god and they you know they distinguished them of course you know they didn't now, they would quote balcom for a different purpose they would quote him for to say that even balcom or balcom i'm sorry mm -hmm. would affirm that john's gospel is less historical and more theological. In other words, they quote him mm. to show that John doesn't give you the words of Jesus. He gives you the meaning and interpretation of Jesus. Hmm. And so the Muslim says, I don't want John's interpretation of Jesus. In other words, if I had a camera and I was recording Jesus, I wouldn't have Jesus say the things that John has him saying, like, I am the way, the truth, and life. So that's why they quote him for that reason. Interesting. Now, say, well, because John is inspired. He's an authoritative interpreter of Jesus so that he can bring out the meanings of Jesus and they are still binding and authoritative nonetheless because it's the Spirit inspiring him to give us the meaning of Jesus. The Muslims hmm. will say baloney. That's simply a nice way of saying John made it up. Yeah, so that's well. That's why would for that purpose. That's why I'm saying when you're dealing with Muslims, best bet, go to Mark's Gospel and make your case for the deity of Christ from Mark's Gospel and then work your way up to John's Gospel to show that it's consistent. From Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, um, just got a couple of minutes here. I wanted to ask you, I guess, um, we've, we've talked a lot of Trinity, and I'm, I'm glad we did. That's kind of what, what, what I wanted to do. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, I, I know you just got back from this trip, but what, what is your main focus right now in terms of ministry? Where, what, is your, yeah. what sort of projects are you working on that you can tell us a little about or, or anything like that? Well, I'm trying to build up my YouTube page, Shemunian, mm -hmm. produce more talks, lengthy talks, and also short videos, build it up for the glory of Jesus Christ. I also write for AnsweringIslam.net, mm -hmm. but I started a blog affiliated with the website. It's AnsweringIslamBlog.wordpress.com. So I want to continue writing in-depth articles, mm -hmm. continue to produce top-notch videos, lengthy and short ones, to edify and build up the body of Christ, because most of my focus is on affirming, defending, articulating core Christian doctrines. Even though people associate me with Islam, as you well know, I mm -hmm. spend more of my time affirming and defending the core doctrines of the Christian faith, such as the Trinity. So this would benefit people across the board. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be witnessing to Muslims to benefit from the material, because the material will also help you in your witness to Unitarians and Jehovah's Witnesses. So yep. that's what I like to do. I like to travel more by the grace of God and teach more and continue to serve Jesus Christ until my last dying breath. So that's what I like to do. So I appreciate your prayers for my success. Mm -hmm. The Lord purify me, keep me pure and holy and in love with him. And also for the provision to do this because we're in full-time ministry by his grace.
Mm-hmm. So that's what I like to do. Awesome, awesome. And and you answered one of my other questions, which is going to just be you know where people can find you, but um, you already did that. So um, I know I'm subscribed to your YouTube channel and and checking that out, and and uh, it's it's been it's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you today. Welcome, yeah, and uh, Nikki, did did anybody else pipe in before the end? Well, no. There have been lots of great comments in the chat. This has been very enlightening. So thank you for coming. Yes, thank you. We, we appreciate it. And uh, God bless you, and God bless you in your ministry. Lord, Lord bless you both and preserve you for his glory in Jesus' name. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Risen indeed. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to this show and sticking with us tonight. Um, looking forward. I think this is going to be a really helpful one for a lot of folks. And, um, yeah, we'll see you next week. And thanks again. See you Tuesday.